My name is Morgan Cephas. I am a state representative for the 192nd Legislative District. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to introduce one of our nation's most prominent and provocative intellectuals, Dr. Cornell West. I think calling him provocative is, um, is just a little bit slight on what he really is. So as a champion for racial justice, he has been educating Americans in and outside the classroom for decades. He is a professor of the practice of public philosophy at Harvard University and a professor at Princeton University. His 20 books include The Best-Selling Democracy Matters and Black Prophetic Fire, an unflinching look at 19th and 20th century African American leaders and their visionary legacies. He can be seen as a frequent guest on Bill Maher's show, CNN, C-SPAN, Democracy Now. I'm not sure if you'll see him on Fox News, but um, <laughs> one, maybe one day. <laughs> when his seminal National Book Award winning work, Race Matters, came out 25 years ago, the Washington Post called its essays as moving as any of the sermons of the Reverend Martin Luther King as profound as W.B. Du Bois' The Souls of Black Folk, as exhilarating in their offering of liberation as James Baldwin's early essays. More relevant than ever, the new edition of West's searing work seeks methods to create a genuinely inclusive 21st century democracy. So with that, I am pleased and proud to announce, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Dr. Cornell West to the Free Library. It's always a blessing and a privilege to return to this consecrated space. And I have very many precious memories of being here. I want to first salute my dear sister Morgan Cephas for your kind words and for your work and witness sitting next to your sister Laura. And of course, you salute Brother Curtis and sister Pamela, your parents. Give it up, give it up for the Cephas family. I don't have words for my dear brother Andy, though. It's been 18 years of high quality service, high quality contribution to the life of the mind, to the culture of reading. And it's, let's give it up for our dear brother Andy. He's very special. Like he's, he's, he's working right now. But it makes a difference in these days and times to have people who are true to their calling, who fundamentally committed to their sense of vocation as opposed to simply their profession. There's no doubt that what proceeds out of his heart, mind, and soul is a deep love of not just reading, but making sure that reading's available to everybody across class, across race, across sexual orientation, across gender. That matters. That matters very, very deeply. And he works with a sister named Laura just had his son Aaron, who also matters for nine years of quality contribution to this institution. I don't know what, whether Brother Tony is here. It's brother, brother Tony Montero. Yeah, yes, he is. Yes, raise your hand, though, brother. It's always a blessing to see. Give it up for Brother Tony, who's a distinguished professor. Distinguished professor, so fundamentally concerned about the legacy W.B. Du Bois. They've got reading clubs now all across this grand city, and that makes a difference. Why? Because I think we're living in one of the bleakest moments in the history of this empire one of the bleakest moments in the history of this fragile experiment in democracy against the backdrop of its imperial realities. And so in a way, this is precisely the kind of moment that tests our hearts, minds, and souls. We discover who we really are, not just what we talk about, not just our chit-chat, but at the very deepest level of our souls, what are we really made of? So what I've tried to do is to return 25 years later after 1993 with the wave of rebellions responding to our dear brother Rodney King's vicious beating by police in Los Angeles. And to raise that question, what does it mean to come to terms with the greatest tradition of moral and spiritual fortitude in the history of the empire? And that's black musical tradition. And of course here in Philadelphia, I could just play John Coltrane and sit down. <laughs> it's true. 
Uh, that's true. I could just turn on Patti LaBelle, or Phyllis Hyman, or Teddy Pendergrass, uh, the Delphonics, uh, Ted Mills of Blue Magic, uh, Russell Tompkins Jr., uh, the Stylistics, uh, the Jones Girls, and just sit down. <laughs> because this tr tradition of black music, which is at the center of the black freedom struggle, is not some form of mere entertainment, it's a form of soul wrestling, wrestling with what it means to be human. That I come from a tradition of a grand people who after 400 years of being terrorized still teach the world so much about freedom. After 400 years of being traumatized still teach the world so much about healing, even as we swing. And Duke's right, don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. And there's staying in the swing if you're telling the truth, if you're bearing witness to justice. The 400 years of being hated systemically, chronically, persistently, teaching the world so much about how to love. And I've always viewed myself as one of the most blessed persons to be a little small moment in that tradition of what it means to be fundamentally committed to love of truth. And the condition of truth is always to allow suffering to speak. In our individual lives, in our national lives, any nation, any civilization, you can rest be assured if somebody's suffering is being hidden and concealed, the full truth is not being heard. That's why here in Philadelphia, we talk about the Constitution. Beautiful, oh, but the Constitution was a pro-slavery document in practice and lost sight of the humanity of indigenous peoples. Their suffering was not heard, so you ended up with a truncated democratic experiment. You're going to end up with a civil war dealing with an institution not invoked in your constitution, hidden and concealed. Chickens come home to roost. Sooner or later, you're going to have to come to terms with what you're holding at arm's length. That's why the tradition that I come from says lift every voice. Every voice. That's at the center of a democratic mode of being in the world. Can't be a jazz musician or a blues woman unless you find your voice. If you're just going to be an echo, then join the crowd tied to conformity. But if you really want to find your voice, you're going to cut against the grain. I, I see Brother Elliot out there. Yes, I do, brother. Oh, raise your hand, Brother Elliot. Here's my dear brother, distinguished professor at Temple, teaching assistant at Princeton a few years ago. But he's still strong as that way. He, Brother Elliot, knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> what the Isley brothers call a caravan of love. The love of truth, love of goodness, keeping track of evil, undeserved harm, unwarranted hurt, no matter whose it is. It's the love of beauty, and they all go hand in hand. Anytime you talk about black freedom, you're not just talking about justice. It's too narrow, it's too emaciated. You're coming from a people who have fell in love with beauty, and there's no serious wrestling with beauty unless you also are wrestling with fear and trauma. Real K is right. And what is it about these people that after 400 years of being traumatized and stigmatized and terrorized, you're still dishing out love warriors. You see, there's never been a figure on the stage of the American stage with more love than mama, written by a genius from the south side of Chicago named Lorraine Hansberry in her 20s, a raisin in the sun. Oh, we've had some towering figures. Our dear brothers Arthur Miller and Eugene O'Neill and August Wilson and a host of others, but nobody has been able to concentrate the black freedom tradition with love at the center if with that mama trying to pass it on to the younger generation of Walter and Travis. I say the same thing about the love-soaked essays of James Ball, when love forces us to take off the mask 
we know we cannot live within, but fear we cannot live without. Love, warrior. Tony Morrison, be love it. Marvin Gaye's What's Going On, love shot through every note, every sound, every silence between the sound. And we ain't got to the full-scale production or the lyrics yet. That's not mere entertainment. That's a profound commitment to a love of beauty and a love of goodness and a love of truth telling. And some of us who are religious also have a love of the holy, a love of God that embraces those three. Now, we've got large numbers of secular brothers and sisters. I know Brother Tony is one of them. Agnostic, atheistic, however you want to describe him. He's my brother. We just disagree on some things. We go to jail together, we get beat up together. I'm calling on Jesus and he's calling on his friends. <laughs> hey, that's all right, my brother, that's all right. That's all right, we're going down together, up, going down together. But the important thing is that when we talk about this tradition, it's a tradition of variety and diversity and heterogeneity, but the common denominator is integrity, honesty, decency, and not just courage, but courage plus magnanimity, courage plus greatness of character, which is fortitude. There's a difference. A Nazi soldier can be courageous and still be a gangster. I saw some courage in Charlottesville, right in front of their face, spitting on us. They were ready to die. I respect people who are willing to die for what they believe in. They're just gangsters. They're just thugs. They're courageous. We don't have enough on the left. We're willing to die like that. We did in the 60s. Mumi Abu-Jamal in jail right now. He's willing to die. We can debate about what happened. Willing to die. Huey was willing to die. Angela was willing to die. Martin was willing to die. Malcolm was willing to die. Fanny was willing to die. Ella Baker was willing to die. Whole wave of folk loving so deeply that they were willing to pay the ultimate cost. We are in deep trouble in part because we're living in a moment of spiritual blackout, which is the relative eclipse and collapse of integrity, honesty, decency, and courage. W. E. Du Bois raised the question, how shall integrity face oppression in that first novel, The or Ordeal of Manzart? He wrote it when he was 83 years old. But when you look around for integrity these days, it's not just a matter of skin pigmentation. It's like cupidity, love of money, venality, everybody for sale, everything for sale. Give them enough money, enough status, enough image, enough spectacle. And we see it in the black musical tradition. It's enough spectacle, enough money, enough visibility. You don't have to sing in tune no more and make a million dollars. <laughs> Carmen, McRae, Carmen McRae turns over in her grave. So does Nat King Cole. So does Frank Sinatra and being on the vanilla side of town. <laughs> black folk ain't got no monopoly on this, but I'm talking about black folk tonight. True among our professional managerial class. Where's a neoliberal soul craft that sits at the center of it, the highest thing that one can conceive in universities in too many instances is to be the smartest in the room. How spiritually empty and impoverished. Let the phones be smart. You got to be wise. The cult of smartness. The cult of smartness. You just listen to the radio, listen, watch it on television, listen to the radio, and, and, and keep track of the number of times people say, obviously, 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 and sometimes not obvious at all. <laughs> but just an in-crowd word, makes you feel smart. I thank God that I was raised by Clifton and Irene West on the chocolate side of Sacramento, California. I thank God I come out of Shiloh Baptist Church where we had pastors and not CEOs where we had an openness to the Black Panther Party. And we were never told to be the smartest in the room. We were told to be the most compassionate. He or she is greatest will be your servant. 
will be willing to tell the truth and willing to pay a cost. That's what greatness is. Don't believe the mainstream that says greatness is about smartness and power and riches and status and spectacle. The spiritual blackout, and I'm using the term of the one and only, the inimitable Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. He talked about spiritual blackout in the 1960s. And he was beginning on the Jewish side of town, his own community. Where is this righteous indignation for the pogroms in the South? Thank God he went there with Martin. Thank God so many Jewish youth went there in the 60s with Martin. But he saw more and more an escalating spiritual blackout. And he said it will be determined in part by the response of the country to the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., because that was his best friend and Martin's best friend. And let us never forget, when I point out in the book, when you talk about Martin Luther King Jr., 72% of white brothers and sisters in America disapproved of him at the end of his life, and over 50% of black people disapproved of Martin at the end of his life. I'm upset when I see every January they truck Martin out and sanitize and domestic domesticate him and sterilize him. When he was alive, critical of the empire in Vietnam, when he was alive, bringing poor people together, when he was alive with a critique of capitalism, there was a large number of black people who said, oh, no, no, I'm a flag waver. I'm not a cross bear. I'm with the empire. I'm not with poor people. France Fanon talking about the wretched of the earth, that's for those revolutionary Africans. That's not for us Negroes here. Martin said, what do you think I'm about? You never understood me. I'm not some narrow civil rights activist. I'm called because I've fallen in love with truth and beauty and goodness, and I've fallen in love with my neighbor, and he's a revolutionary Christian like myself, which meant he even loved his enemies. Now, I know me and Brother Tony disagree on that, too. <laughs> but I like to be honest and candid about where I stand and how I situate and locate myself in terms of the people who invested in me to make sure that I could somehow be as decent a human being as I can be. Now, when we talk about this moment of spiritual blackout, a lot of folk want to begin with Trump at the top. And the last thing we need to do is fetishize Trump. Magical powers of Trump. If we can just get rid of Trump, get back to business as usual, we're in good shape. No, get off the crack pipe. <laughs> Trump is as American as apple pie. He represents the worst of the American empire, the misogyny, the white supremacy, the hatred, or at least the devaluing of the immigrants, the connection to big money, connection to big military, Talk about the working class, but no connection with them whatsoever. There's a long tradition of that. He just happens to be the sign and the symptom of what is taking place today in terms of the spiritual blackout in our imperial meltdown. And yes, Donald Trump is a gangster. There's no doubt about that. And I, when I say gangster, I'm not engaged in any kind of subjective expression. That's an objective condition, being a gangster. <laughs> it is. If you're grabbing a woman's private parts, that's gangster. If you see another country has oil and you think you ought to go get it without asking them, that's gangster. And I could go on and on and on, but this is not a Trump on Donald Trump's gangsterism. This is not a lecture on that. I just trotting out some examples. But most importantly, I'm not just engaging in name calling and finger pointing. Because I was a gangster before I met Jesus, and now I'm a redeemed sinner with gangster proclivities. <laughs> what does that mean? That means there's a gangster inside of me trying to get out. <laughs> oh, yes. I've got some hatred inside of me. I couldn't grow up in this country and not wrestle with white supremacy inside of me, wrestle with male supremacy inside of me, wrestle with anti-Arab, anti-Jewish, anti-Muslim orientation, wrestle with homophobia and transphobia. That's what it is to grow up in the American empire. It's inside each and every one of us. 
And the last thing we need to do is somehow point the finger and not engage in a critical self-examination, critical interrogation, a scrutiny of somehow how do we allow the best to emerge out of this. Now, what is fascinating about this moment is we are more and more seeing the best of those in the American empire. The awakening is taking place, especially among the younger generation. From the movement of black lives, to the critiques of sexism and misogyny, to more and more focus on the most vulnerable among us, which happens to be our precious trans folk, of color especially. It's a human thing. Those whose humanity has been rendered invisible, which is another way of saying those who are left out because in a moment of spiritual blackout, you get the normalizing of mendacity, the naturalizing of criminality, the rewarding of indifference, and the encouragement to callousness. And that is the makings of a catastrophic condition with various levels that cannot but produce more and more neo-fascist sensibilities, neo-fascist policies, and neo-fascist ways of being in the world. And what is that? Machismo force, lack of accountability to the vulnerable, the, the emergence of big business, big money, scapegoating the most vulnerable, especially the immigrants and the women and the gays and lesbians and Jews and black folk and others, but refusing to confront the most powerful. Rabbi Hesher used to say, indifference to evil is more, ev more insidious than evil itself. What happens when you live in a culture that escalates, sees the escalation of indifference, people just not caring about the vulnerable? And this cuts across race, cuts across class. There's no way we can have a mass incarceration regime in the last 25 years without people turning their backs to our precious brothers and sisters in the hood, dealing with dilapidated educational systems and massive unemployment and underemployment, and dealing with trauma, with shattering of various families, networks, hungry for love, and oftentimes not receiving it, and oftentimes going to the gains for a sense of belonging as the drugs and the guns continue to flow inside for economic sustenance indifference. Brother Elliot knows in the 1980s we had students under Reagan. The indifference was already setting in. Now it's indifference on steroids. Callousness, just not caring. Sister Laura was telling me the last time we were here, we were here for the poverty tour. And this was during the Obama years. And I see, that was very controversial. We won't get into all of that. We, that's a whole nother lecture. <laughs> but of course, we were there to say, black folk, we not only love you, we're going to tell the truth about you. We're going to be faithful unto death of the tradition that produced you. But you know, black folk, that if black middle class kids were going to jail at the same level of black poor kids, we'd have different kind of black leadership. You know, black folk. That even under a black president, even with a black attorney general, even with a black homeland security in the cabinet, you, see, you still didn't have a war against poverty. You hardly talked about poverty. And yet one out of two of black children and brown children under six years old live in utter poverty in the richest nation of the history of the world. That is a moral disgrace under any president. I don't care what color they are. Because it's a matter of being morally consistent. It's a matter of what Jane Austen called being a co with constancy. Are you going to tell the same truth to whoever's in the White, whoever's in the State House, whoever is in the City Hall? Why? Because it's a moral and spiritual issue. The same would be true in terms of drone strikes that a baby in Yemen or Pakistan or Afghanistan or Libya has exactly the same value as a vanilla baby in Newtown, Connecticut or a brown baby in East Los Angeles or a black baby in North Philly or a red baby in Wisconsin on the reservation. 
And if you get you in trouble, then fine, just wade in the water. God going to trouble the water. And a precious Palestinian baby in West Bank and Gaza has exactly the same value as a precious Jewish baby in Tel Aviv. If you lose sight of the humanity of both of them, then you got truncated truth. And it's complicated, it's delicate, it's difficult, but you have to be clear about where you stand. We used to have a brother who played organ in my church every fifth Sunday. We called him Sylvester, but he's known to the world for the genius that he is. His name is Sly Stone. He's the head of the North California Mass Choir. This is before he went secular. Though, of course, like Ray Charles, he never really goes secular. <laughs> But he wrote a song called, Stan, you've been sitting much too long. There's a permanent crease in your right and wrong. Stan, there's a midget standing tall and the giant beside him about to fall. Y'all remember that song? Now, young folk, not, check it out on the internet. <laughs> check it out. Stan, there's a cross for you to bear. Things to go through if you going anywhere. Integrity facing oppression. Honesty facing deception. Decency facing insult. Fortitude, courage plus magnanimity facing brute force. All four pillars fundamental for the spiritual and moral awakening that is required for prophetic fight back against spiritual blackout and imperial meltdown. Now, what do I mean by imperial meltdown? Well, one is, is that we cannot be pre-Du Bois in. Du Bois taught us going back to 1915. That in order to understand the United States, you have to understand the United States as in part an empire that tried to create a democratic experiment, but that democratic experiment had tremendous obstacles and impediments in part because its imperial status and in part because its vicious legacies of white supremacy, male supremacy, overwhelming rule of capital over labor, and homophobia and transphobia. One of the greatest voices and talked about this is the great Adrian Rich, student of the inimitable Muriel Rukeyser, who's also the teacher of Alice Walker. Rukeyser is the great Whitman-esque figure of the 20th century when it comes to prophetic, poetic reflection and witness. Why is that important? Because to be able to keep track of the best and the worst People ask me all the time, Brother West, you always sound so anti-American. No, no, no. I'm anti-injustice in America. I'm anti-injustice in Ethiopia. I'm anti-injustice in Guatemala. I'm anti-injustice in Mexico. I just don't live there. At least not yet. With these fascists on the move, you don't know where you end up. <laughs> you read about me in Ethiopia. That's right. I'm the, I'm the one. I mean, we laugh, but you got to laugh keep from crying. Repression is real. Violence, force, coercion is very real, especially if you're serious about truth, goodness, beauty, and the holy tied to the plight and predicament of the least of these. But at the center, the genius of Hebrew scripture, the spreading of hesed, loving kindness, to the orphan and the widow, the poor, the oppressed, the persecuted, doing justly, loving mercy, walking humbly with one's God. And then that Palestinian Jew named Jesus building on it. And there's no understanding of the black musical tradition, no understanding of black freedom tradition without generating love warriors who were obsessed with trying to inculcate and exemplify to the best of their ability given their finitude and fallibility. This love of truth and goodness and beauty and holy. Where is it today? It is around, 
but it's hard for it to coalesce. It's more and more isolated and more and more being pushed to the margins. When we live in a culture, which is a kind of joyless quest for insatiable pleasure, so you don't find joy in telling the truth. You just want pleasure in consequences and results given one's attempt to engage in up with social mobility, chasing the dollar, obsessed with living large in usually some vanilla suburb, often with a trophy spouse. I'm not talking about anybody in here, but I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the culture at large. How empty. Black freedom struggle, the black musical tradition begins with what is often denied in the American mainstream. It begins with the catastrophic, not just the problematic. There's never been a race problem in America. There's been catastrophes visited on black people. It's not a problem. You're already deodorizing the discourse, keep it funky. Tell the truth. No such thing as a woman's problem in America. There's been catastrophes visited on women. You're already trying to domesticate it. How come? Because of our pragmatic sensibility. With pragmatism, we're just concerned with problem solving. <laughs> Technocratic mentality. Oh, yes, it's just a matter of a problem. Once we get the right technique, once we get the right skill in place. No, no, this is not a question of technique and skill. This is a question of what kind of human being you are. This is a question of what kind of structures and institutions are in place. If you assume the prevailing structures and institutions in place that are helping create the problem or the backdrop that you will not call into question, then all the technical reflection and all of the problem solving is not going to do it. That's what happened in the 1960s. All we got to do is let these Negroes vote. No, it's deeper than that. Black people have been terrorized. You better get your police accountable. Oh, yeah, you got to get them accountable. And if they kill somebody, they need to go to jail like anybody else. You better get them accountable. You better get your schools accountable. If your school's still running around talking about manifest destinies, well, somehow you got 13 colleges, ended up with 50, and that was the God's work, then you need to understand what imperialism is. Tell the young folk how Texas and California and Arizona and New Mexico were once Mexico and all of a sudden ended up under the U.S. auspices. L read Ulysses S. Grant's memoirs about this phony war. Read Henry David Thoreau going to jail. Read Ralph Waldo Emerson saying this war is so wrong and immoral is going to backfire on us. And then we get upset when some of the Mexican brothers and sisters want to come back home. Oh, I see. Oh, no. Let's tell the truth about the history. We know it's more complicated than that. We know issues of policy. But you can't start with just problems and policies. You got to understand context. You got to understand context. You got to come to turn with lynching. Shot through American life. Over 50 years, every two and a half days, some black body hanging from some tree, that strange fruit, the southern trees bear that the great Billy Holiday sang about with such power, that genius from Baltimore City and the Jewish brother Maripol writing the lyrics. What are you getting at, Billy? What are you getting at, Maripol? This is American terrorism. This is not discrimination, segregation. That's deodorized discourse for the textbooks. What goes into a, such a culture that can sustain lynching for that long? It's not just a matter of giving folk the right to vote and you deal with all the dimensions of the problem. No, it's a catastrophe. It's psychic. It's political. It's economic. It's cultural. It is existential. And by existential, what I mean, when one's own very being and body is being demeaned and devalued, voting is not going to get the at it. Of course we want everybody to vote, but vote for who? If the, if the political system is so colonized by big money, then who are you choosing? How do you sustain high quality politicians with all of that big money? Our dear sister could break it down in ways I know not of. But I know you see it there in Harrisburg. Oh, yes. I haven't been to Harrisburg in decades. Have no plans going on. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I love you. I love you. I love, love you and folk there. 
I just spent more time in Philly and Pittsburgh. You understand? <laughs> no, I'll try to love everybody. You all got me having fun up here, but you can imagine. This is very, very serious business. And I went, when I got a chance to put pen to paper to write a brand new introduction, after 25 years, when I look back into reading that book, 1993, when I put pen to paper, and I was hopeful. And I've never been an optimist. I don't believe in optimism. I've never been a pessimist. I don't believe in pessimism. I'm a prisoner of hope. But I've reached the point now where I don't even like to talk about hope because that's been colonized. <laughs> don't like to talk about hope. You see, I just want to be a hope. I don't want to say a word about it. Because all we have left are exemplary movements, exemplary institutions, and exemplary individuals. And by example, through the sustained display of integrity, which is not purity, of honesty in an age of mendacity, of decency in an age of that which is indecent, especially callousness, hardening of heart, coarsening of conscience, not caring about folk on the other side of town, not caring about poor, not caring about the vulnerable. Well, look at the Me Too movement. Misogyny run amok, which is, which is more intense than sexism, and sexism is evil. All this time, so many people knew what was going on, wouldn't say a mumbling word. They are my friends. Oh, really? Then when they get caught, the self-righteous, oh, that, oh yeah, yeah, well, I'm part of the movement too. Oh, what you talking about? You were hanging out with the cat just a couple of years ago. <laughs> Wouldn't say a mumbling word. That's callousness. But what is it also? It's cowardliness. Because so many want, too many want to fit in. And the neoliberal soul craft is smartness, richness at home, bombs abroad, Thank you, brother. Bombs abroad and can't wait to be highly successful in public while being well adjusted to injustice and well adapted to indifference. And yet, when folk become successful, you're not supposed to be critical in any form. Because if you're critical to somebody successful, they call you a hater. You're supposed to celebrate their success. Well, how did they become successful? And what are they doing with their success? And what's the quality of their hearts, minds, and souls, and deeds with their? That's not the point. They got over. Oh, I see. I see. So you end up with either getting over or the 11th commandment, thou shalt not get caught. <laughs> Only two options left. And it's true on the internet. It's hard to have a serious conversation that critically engages people's visions and their analysis and so forth. You're supposed to just celebrate your success. I thank God in 1993 that when I became highly, highly visible, part of the spectacle with the liberal establishment wanting to make me the darling, I said, no, you got the wrong black man. <laughs> wrong black man. What did I do? First thing I did was I went hand in hand with the man, man, march. Now, if you want to become unpopular in mainstream America, just join forces with my dear brother, Minister Louis Farrakhan. <laughs> that's, that's, that's automatic. That's automatic. And we fight over patriarchy. We fight over homophobia. We fight over, whole, we fight over things he said about Jewish brothers and sisters. Oh, indeed, indeed. Indeed, indeed. But the last thing you want is to end up being just the darling of any establishment that puts a premium on conformity that doesn't allow for a critical conversation and discourse because all of us must be interrogated if we are to grow, develop, and mature. And that's what we need today more than anything else. We've got an ecological catastrophe. You can't talk about race matters without talking about earth matters. We got nuclear catastrophe. You can't talk about race matters without talking about those missiles matter. 
economic catastrophe. Top three individuals in the country have wealth equivalent to 160 million, 50% of their fellow citizens. You can't talk about race matters, we're talking about class matters. Same is true with this dysfunctional political system. It's not just a matter of a Congress shot through with cowardliness and polarization and the presidency run by a gangster with friends. No, it's not just that. In the midst of that dysfunctionality, the oligarchs and the plutocrats come out even more victorious with the tax cuts and so forth and so on. It's catastrophic on working people, catastrophic on poor people. And then there's civic catastrophe where it's just nearly impossible these days, so sad for people who disagree politically and ideologically to enter the same public space and engage in, dis in dialogue, given that disagreement with some degree of respect so you can still learn and listen to one another even given the disagreement. John Dewey says in his classic of 1927, the public and its problems show me a democracy that so devalues public conversation, I'll show you the democracy sliding down the slippery slope to tyranny. It's 1927 of John Dewey. But last but not least is the cultural catastrophe with the increasing trauma tied to drug addiction, sex addiction, addiction to success, addiction to being highly part of the spectacle. And it leads to self-medication usually. We're seeing that more and more and more across race, across gender, across class. Folk just losing the ability to cope. And one of the distinctive features of this, and I'm going to end up with the black musical tradition. And I make much of this in, in, in my introduction. Because one of the great contributions that black people have made to this culture is a soulfulness, and soul is the sharing of a soothing sweetness against the backdrop of a bleak catastrophe that allows you to keep on pushing in the language of Curtis Mayfield, you see. So when you hear Russell Tompkins Jr. or Patti LaBelle or David Ruffin, or we just lost Brother Dennis Edwards of the Tim, when you hear their voice, hear a sweetness and a vulnerability and a frailness that opens up your heart, mind, and soul because they're trying to stir your soul. They're not just trying to stimulate their, your body. That's one of the differences between the finest, the greatest entertainer of our day, who is Beyonce, and I salute her. I salute her. But I remind her she ain't no Aretha. <laughs> and that's not a put down. But Aretha's got a sweetness in her sound because she comes from a tradition that in the face of misery can give you artistic delicacy. And that delicacy gets to your humanity. It gets to the core of who you are. You, it was very interesting with the neo-Nazis in Charlottesville. They were marching, some of them listening to black music. You say, hey, what's happening? Give me my music. But they won't give it back. That's been true in the history of this nation. You can't escape that sweetness and that kindness. You can't escape that delicacy. You can't escape that connection with your humanity that renders you vulnerable just as they are vulnerable. That's what Stevie's about on the piano. That's what Ray Charles is about. That's what Billy, that's what Sarah Vaughn was about. Not just the artistic greatness, but also that soulfulness. What happens in a culture? that begins to thoroughly lose its soul, even if it gains the world? That's the question we wrestle with. Black folk been wrestling with that question for 400 years and still dishing out the love warriors. But what happens when that tradition begins to run out of gas, including the black freedom tradition? And when black folk themselves become more interested in career and spectacle and money and status, rather than what their grandparents were interested in, which is you be a person with integrity, honesty, and decency, and even if you are defeated at the moment, you still win spiritually with your integrity because you refuse to be a gangster like those who are gangsterizing you. That's the tradition we're talking about, and that's in part what I'm about. Thank you all so very much. We have a good, good, good time for questions and answers. 
Uh, I, my question is about the future of electoral politics in this country. Um, I love that you abnegated from the Democratic Party uh, in 2016 after you know years of disappointment um, and that you supported Dr. Jill Stein and the Green Party. Um, so my question is basically what do you see as the future of electoral politics in this country, not just at a federal level but also at the lower rungs of government? Do you see any hope for the Democratic Party or is it something that should just be abandoned given, you know, years or decades of disappointment? We well, appreciate the question. Now, and one of the, uh, the wonderful things I think we take away in the last two years is if fellow citizens in this nation could vote, uh, uh, if, those who, if the only ones who could vote were between 18 and 30, Brother Bernie would be in the White House rather than Donald Trump. That's very important. That's part of the awakening that's taking place. But I think any time you talk about an institution, any time you talk about a tradition, you never want to homogenize, which is to say you're going to find folk in the Democratic Party who are leaning in a direction that one can work with. You're going to find folk who are not. And so in that regard, I, I would never want to engage in a massive indictment of the Democratic Party. I would say just for the most part is run by spineless, milk toast neoliberal elites. <laughs> for the most part. But that doesn't mean everybody in the party follows them. You got those inside the party who are very critical. And in fact, Brother Bernie was able to convince large numbers of fellow Democratic Party people uh, to vote for him, even though he came in as an outsider, as a sign that there is an openness there. I do think that both parties are more and more hollow these days. That's one of the things we learned from the election with Trump. Republican Party, collapse. What's left is opportunism, turning away from mendacity, criminality, characterized by Trump and fellow followers for the most part. But the Democratic Party also collapsed. And the only thing left was Sister Hillary. And it was hard to generate passion and enthusiasm of Sister Hillary because she's brilliant and a whole host of other things, like Obama, both of them brilliant as they can be. But at the same time, it was hard to see ways in which she could convince large numbers of folk who had been suffering given her identification with Wall Street, like Obama. How many Wall Street executives went to, went to jail under Barack Obama? Hillary, the same, same neoliberal orientation toward Wall Street in that sense. So that I, I don't know what the future is. It depends on the response of those in the Democratic Party. As you know, they were kind enough to put me on the platform committee. Now, any party put me on the platform committee. <laughs> it's like Will Rogers, you know what I mean? <laughs> Something's got to be wrong with you. You put me, I'm a free black man, a Jesus-loving free black man, put me on the platform committee. We're going to talk about Israeli occupation. We're going to talk about drone strikes. We're going to talk about working class. We're going to talk about Wall Street across the board. And that's exactly what we did. That's exactly what we did. We put the pressure on. But it had to be based on moral and spiritual criteria, standards, concerned about the least of these, no matter where, it, no matter where they were. So I'm always improvisational in this regard. I've got some good friends in the Democratic Party. They got a right to be right and wrong. You see what I mean? Now, the Republican Party is, that's a different thing. Because <laughs> they're human beings and made an image of God, but oh my God. 61% of Christian evangelicals for a gangster Trump. Oh, what a slap in the face of Jesus. Just slapping him in the face, putting him back on the cross. You see, Oh, we look away. We're not concerned. Oh, you've been talking about Christian morality with all these Democrats all this time, and you get somebody who sexual predator, a whole host of others. Oh, no, he's sent by God. Oh, please. Please. The history of institutionalized religion is such an unpretty story. The accommodation of domination and hatred and resentment and envy. That's what we saw once again going back to Constantine in the Christian context just adjust itself to the powers that be and then sprinkle some divine powder over it. Oh my God, can you imagine the righteous indignation of an Amos or an Esther or a Jesus or a Muhammad or a Buddha or a Gandhi. One can go on and on and on, Dorothy Day and so forth and so on. 
I'm interested in your thoughts about the impact of growing up in the heartland of California in Sacramento in the 1960s. How did that impact who you are today? Oh, my dear, this is a fundamental impact. I mean, I talked about Irene and Clifton. I'll never be <coughs> half the human being my father was. He died in 94. My mother's still going strong, 86, was elementary school, named after her Irene B. West in Sacramento. Uh, we were, uh, yeah, mom, mom was, mom something. Uh, but, but we were, uh, see, but I was born in Oklahoma. See, I was born in Tulsa. And that made a difference, too. I was born in the same hospital as the Wilson Brothers of the Gap Band. <laughs> well, that's very important, because Gap stands for Greenwood Archer and Pine. That's Black Wall Street. She dropped a bomb on me. Y'all know that song? It was the bombs dropped on black people. I mean, other than dropping the bomb on Move here in Philadelphia, only two times in the history of this nation. The local authorities dropped bombs on fellow citizens. Now, why is that important? Well, that's very important because coming from Oklahoma, Territory, Ralph Ellison's from there, John Hope Franklin's from there. This sense of freedom, this sense of possibility, this sense of uh, self-respect and self-confidence that black folk were bringing. There was an attempt to make Oklahoma an all-black state with, under Chief Sam. And when Garvey arrived, he was looking for Chief Sam as well as Booker T. Washington, because Chief Sam was trying to make Oklahoma an all-black state. When he failed, he went to Sierra Leone. So when Garvey arrives in March 1916, he's looking for Chief Sam. Chief Sam gone. Well, that sense of openness, we're going to be free one way or the other through exit, fight, flight, whatever it's going to be. We're going to go down swinging. Now, when that, we got to California, we joined with folk like that. And it's no accident the Black Panther Party was founded just right down the road in Oakland, East Bay, with the a PK, the son of Reverend Walter Newton, pastor of Bethel Baptist Church, who was known as the baddest Negro in Monroe, Louisiana, where the police wouldn't touch him with a 10-foot pole. That's the father of Huey Newton. And he's in Oakland. Bobby's from Texas. We can go on and on and on in terms of that California context. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, California makes Negroes revolutionary. No, that's not true. No, no. But there's a sense of openness. You, know, you listen to the voice of a Sly Stone and his sister Rose. Unbelievable. Rooted in the South, but this sense of sunshine land in California. So that, I think, informs some of what I am. And then, of course, I've been lost in translation on the East Coast for 41 years. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a West Coast brother to the core. I just wanted to get your thoughts on uh, just the current state of drug policy in the United States and Philadelphia. Right now we're talking about redressing some of the war on drugs, uh, harms, you know, the you know, yeah. criminalization of black people, mass incarceration, breaking up of neighborhoods. But now we're decriminalizing marijuana. We're talking about opening up um, you know, safe injection sites, safe consumption sites where people can inject or inhale or, or anything. I, ju I just want to talk about your, uh, you to talk about your thoughts on that. Yeah, I appreciate that question. You can imagine, uh, dear brother, you need not only a lecture, but somebody who really knows the ins and outs and internal dynamics of drug policy in the last 10, 15 years. One of my uh, attempts has been to support uh, good folk like Michelle Alexander and Angela Davis and others who've been calling for a moratorium on the war uh, against drugs, which has been very much a war against the poor. How do you bring it to a close? How do you engage in mass de-incarceration with those nonviolent offenders. So that yes, there's been attempt to decriminalize marijuana, there's been attempts to make available certain kinds of, of, of sites of rehabilitation. I think those are very positive moves, but we've got a, a long way to go in terms of acknowledging the ways in which the hyper-incarceration regime that was created over the last 30 years or so uh, requires massive transformation, fundamental transformation with significant investment of funds. And of course, that's going to be a question of, of priority when you got already a 53 cents of every dollar going to the military industrial complex. You're going to have to talk about demilitarizing the budget as well as talking about allowing the funds to flow and be invested in such a way that we could deal not just with the drug, but also health care, single payer health care, also be able to deal with quality education, 
quality education. I want every young person in this nation to have the same context and seminars as Exeter and Handover, where they get that special attention. <laughs> Exeter, that's right. And they told every day, you're brilliant, you're brilliant, whether you are or not. You're brilliant, you're brilliant. Self-confidence that makes all the difference in the world for young people undergoing early stages of education, being socialized in our schools and so on. So you can imagine this is a comprehensive program that we're talking about, but I am buoyed up in terms of some of the moves that have been made, very much so. Good evening, Dr. West. How you doing, my brother? Good to see you. Um, I'm from the Poor People's Economic mm -hmm. Human Rights Campaign. You have to meet Brother William Barber. And my name is Gail Tyler. Oh, yes, but I mean, is that William Barber's thing, no, or is that a different thing? No, no, it was Sherry Hunkler and the Poor People's Economic Human Rights came here about 100 some different groups around the country. Oh, that's magnificent. Just tell, us, to, tell us more about that, though, brother. No, I just wanted to thank you, because you actually marched with us on the opening day of the DNC. I wanted to oh, thank you. Oh, that's who I was marching with. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right on, right on. No, go ask your question. No, I was just wondering because, um, you know, coming up, you know, you know, it's the 50 year um, anniversary of the Martin Luther King's Poor People's um, Campaign and his march and, you know, the Resurrection City in Washington, D.C. We're actually doing a march in June the 2nd. And we was wondering if you'd like to come on that march as well. Oh, <laughs> brother, brother, I appreciate that. Don't know, it's, June 2nd is my birthday. So that would be a perfect place for me to be, but if I'm not there, then you can rest assured I'm with my mama, brother, and you understand that, though, don't you? You understand that. Now, I should also say in relation to what you all have been doing, which is so important, that um, I'm in close contact with William Barber. We're going to be in Selma, Alabama, March the 2nd through the 4th, going back to Lowndes County, where so much of the focus was in the 1960s tied to wrestling with poverty. And that was true not just for Martin Luther King Jr., that was true for Robert Kennedy. Robert Kennedy underwent a magnificent awakening coming out of the Catholic elite of New England. When he saw what was going on, oh, lo and behold, he began to have to broaden his view. That's what we're trying to do. But William Barber and yourself are those who are trying to accent the fundamental realities of poverty. And by poverty, we mean not just those wrestling with extreme poverty as precious and priceless as they are, but the working poor, working people who are near poverty, wrestling with unnecessary economic insecurity as the top 1% break dance to the bank <laughs> over and over and over and over again, you see. So that I salute the work that you're doing. And as you can imagine, we need to coalesce. And what is needed is a thoroughgoing multiracial coalition of those who care about the vulnerable, who care about the vulnerable, you see. And when we say multiracial, that doesn't mean that it's a downplaying of racism. It means we're not going to talk about race matters unless we talk about class matters and gender matters and trans matters and empire matters. Do we have a chance of fundamental transformation? Who knows? It's always an open question. But what I love about the best of the black tradition is that even if there's a chance of a snowball in hell, <laughs> of winning immediately, spiritually and morally, you're going to fight for what is right no matter what until the worms get your body. Thank you all so very much. <laughs>